Good morning, Paul. Morning, morning. 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 Good morning. Morning. René, alles gut? Alles prima, wie höre ich da? Anita <lacht> Kendo. What's up, Anita? Buenos dias, good morning. Morning. Hello. Morning. Morning, John. Morning, guys. Look at this nice camera. Morning. 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 Goedemorgen. Goedemorgen. Paul, oh, Tom, how y'all doing, man? Good, thanks. Good. Sanjeev, what's up, my friend? We have you're, on, you're on mute. You're on mute. It's uh, negative 25 degrees outside and it's sunny. <laughs> <laughs> We have some of our Canadian friends here today, huh? At least it's sunny. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Lots of vitamin D outside. <laughs> well, we got a good What's turnout. Up, How are you? All right. We'll give it another uh, another minute or two here. Sure. Paul, I see there's a couple of people still in the waiting room. Do you need to manually let them in or I can do it? Hold on. Yeah, do it. admit all. Sure. Admit, admit, okay. We're grown, we got about 64 people. So another one, yep. So Paul, we're gonna have to kind of keep an eye on this while um, we're talking. While I'm talking, maybe you can because people might be trying to get in while we're when we start. Yeah, no problem, uh -huh. no problem. Yeah, I got yep. Or we could put we could just hit this right here where it says just admit all. You want to go for that? Yeah, no, I got it, Tom. Okay. I'll watch it. All righty. Okay, well let let's let's get going here. Um, first of all, thank you everyone for for jumping on today. Great to see uh, so many people on. Um, and you know, it looks like people from all over our country. We got some people from Canada. Uh, I recognize a lot of a lot of people on this call. I think we got some people from Europe as well, um, which is amazing. Um, yes, very very special uh, coaches collaborative today uh, with our, our special guest Renee Muhlenstein, um, and obviously our good good friend here Tom Byer, uh, who we work with with the Houston Dynamo. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass it over to, to these guys, but I'll kind of let you know a little bit about the format. What I'll do is um, if it gets too noisy on the, on the background, I'm going to have to, I'll mute everybody and then just unmute these guys so they can, they can talk if it gets too loud. Definitely want to make sure that there's no background noise to it. And then we have, you know, a uh, presentation from Renee, uh, but also from Tom and, and, and um, there's some set questions and answers that we can ask at the end. Um, if you have any questions, please write them in the chat. Uh, I can't guarantee that we'll get to all of them, but we're gonna try to you know, have 90 minutes of great, great learning and sharing together. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna pass it on over to Tom, who will introduce uh, his, his good friend, Renee. Okay, thank you, Paul. Let me share my screen real quick. Share. Okay, Paul, you, you've, you've got my top slide on there, right? Yep. Okay, well, well uh, hello to everybody. Um, I'm Tom Beyer. I'm here in, uh, coming to you from Tokyo, Japan, uh, where it's uh, mm -hmm. right, uh, beautiful time of day, two o'clock in the morning. 
<laughs> so as Paul said, I work with the Houston Dynamo. I've been working with the Dynamo. I'm in my third year, um, heading up a project called uh, Football or Soccer Starts at Home. We'll talk, some of you already know about that program. Some may not. We'll talk a little bit about that. But it's not, it's not really about that t today. Um, it's about uh, my good friend Rene Molenstein here, who um, we are so fortunate uh, to be able to, to get his time. This is a guy who's so busy being pulled in every direction you can imagine. Um, and my connection with, with, first of all, this top page here, Rene's got a, a new book out. Um, I would recommend it to everybody, no matter what, what age or, or what level or phase you're, you're coaching at. Um, there's something in there for everybody. So uh, go out and check out his book. It, it just came out recently, and, it, and it's awesome. Um, Rene and I are connected from this man right here, Will Kerver. Um, Rene, it, it, some of you, I'm sure, have heard of the Kerver method. Um, and hopefully today, you're going to get the best interpretation of Will's work um, from the man who was his really main top assistant um, for many years out in Qatar. Um, Will unfortunately passed away in 2011, but Will really changed the way that uh, technical development was even thought about. Um, he was a pioneer way ahead of his time. Um, I was fortunate to be working with the Curver Method out here in Japan, where it's probably the largest Curver Methodology School going on uh, here in Japan, but this is my connection um, with Rene. Now, the alphabet doesn't start with X, Y, and Z. It starts with A, B, and C. I work and I specialize basically in the ABCs. I'm a foundation coach focusing on technical development at the very young ages. Rene, which is very, very unusual, basically spans the whole alphabet. He goes from A to Z. XYZ being the top of the top, but he has basically worked at all levels in multiple continents, multiple countries with the youngest of the young and the best of the best. Um, if you know about his history, um, obviously most notably um, at, uh, at Manchester United, where he basically uh, was, was he, he ran the gambit there. They, he was brought in, he'll talk more about that, so I'm not gonna steal his thunder. Um, but he has won just about every single trophy possible when he was at Manchester United, multiple uh, uh, EPL titles, FA Cup, I mean, just everything, Champions League, and, and he's going to go into that more. Um, and then, you know, he's, he's been a head coach as well um, in different clubs in different countries around the world as, as well. And he's got his, his own, obviously, he's going to talk about this. Um, I really always pick his brain when I first met uh, Rene, picking his brain because he, he was working at Man U during these days when Ronaldo was really just a young player. And he's going to tell you some really, really great uh, uh, nuggets of wisdom um, about what, what he did with Ronaldo um, when he was a young player. And then obviously winning championships, multiple. And then Rene's obviously got his own, he's got his own methodology, the, the Mosley methodology that he's going to talk about as well. So with no further ado, I am going to stop sharing here um and let's see hold on and i'm going to pass it over to rene mullenstein to give us his presentation thank you uh, rene t t t take over the reins here if you can and we'll give you feedback uh with, let's see i okay. will do. i think it's all yours thank you thank you so much uh, tom um, and what a fantastic introduction i could have i could have not have done it any better myself <laughs> And thanks, Paul, uh, with the Houston Dynamo for, for inviting me and, and thanks for you guys in, in calling in. I really hope that this, you know, 90 minutes, hour and a half, so to speak, is going to be beneficial to you. So hopefully it's going to be informative. It's going to be educational. Um, maybe some, 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 some nice stories along the way. Um, um, Tom is in Tokyo. You guys are... Most of you somewhere in the United States. I'm still uh, in, the, in the UK, close to Manchester. That's where I'm based. But <clears throat> as you probably all know, I was born in, in Holland, in the Netherlands, in a very tiny little village. And the reason why I, I like to share that with you, or Paul and Tom asked me to share that with you, because every, every uh, coach's uh, you know, career starts with a journey. You know, and, and how do you sort of progress on that on that journey? So, 
so to speak. So I came, I came from a very tiny little village uh, called Bergen. Uh, the one good thing that Holland has is that they've got a fantastic soccer infrastructure. Uh, people that have been there, maybe on, on soccer camps, they know that Holland, every small village, has got his own club with own facilities, great fields, floodlit, artificial, everything, everything is there. And therefore, that's one of the reasons why, why Holland, you know, has basically over the years produced so many, so many fantastic, fantastic players. Uh, funny enough, it was already when I was 16 and I was still wanting to obviously play soccer myself, I still had a dream to become a professional uh, footballer or, or try to play at the highest level as possible. But, you know, where I was sort of lived, I was sort of caught in a triangle between Nijmegen, Venlo and Eindhoven, where PSV is based. And scouting, I would say, in the early 70s, 70s, wasn't really what it is now. You know, nowadays, there's not going to be any player unnoticed. You know, with all the technology that they've got, every player will surface. And, and, and good scouts from all the clubs will have a look at him. At that time, th that wasn't the case for us. So you basically had to try to, to build your own soccer career and try to go and play a little bit at a higher level. But what I've always, always felt, I was, always, I was only, what was it, maybe 500 yards from, from, from our local soccer club. So I was there every day, every night. During the day I was playing, whether it was training, I was watching training or playing with other kids, I was always, always there. And when I was 16, I can still remember a coach that was coaching the, the, the six, seven-year-olds asked me if I could sort of help him out because he was struggling. I said, yeah, fine, no problem. I, I really enjoyed it. And then <clears throat> the one most important thing that basically is almost the most important thing that helped me shape my career for the rest of my life was that I got introduced to Curva and the Curva method. And one day I was strolling around in the next door village and I came past the bookstore and in the, in the window, there was a book and it was this book. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the first book. It was that says football, the ideal, the plan for the ideal football player. And it was written by Will Curver. He had success himself with Feyenoord, winning the UEFA cup and all that. The most intriguing thing was when I read the preface, and you can see here, I highlighted all the different things yep. that I thought were important. And I read the preface, and I can tell you, I'm not, I'm not the per sort of person that would go to university, but I thought to myself, you don't have to go to university to understand what this man means. And basically what he was saying, partly from his own experience, he said, I've coached Sparta Rotterdam, I coached Feyenoord, I coached NEC Nijmegen, and he said, why was Ajax or all those teams, why were, they, why were they better than us, than Sparta? I could organize every team defensively, very hard to break down, but I couldn't really get my team, you know, to give them extra, something extra on the attacking side of the game, to make it more unpredictable, to give them the opportunities to, you know, to beat an opponent. So he started to, to study, you know, um, that way, and he basically analyzed all the top, top players in his particular time, you know, uh, from, from maybe a lot of you persons, you guys might, might even remember, but going back as far as Puskas, Di Stefano, obviously we all know Pele, Cruyff, Beckenbauer, Charlton, Eusebio, all of them, those players. And he sort of started to analyze them and he started to draw the conclusion that he said, well, all those players, they've got the ability in some shape or form to dominate the one v one. And then he started to actually analyze what they did. And then he started to analyze all the, all the top coaches that were around. He went to visit them. He went to see them. And he came to the conclusion that basically all those players were not a product of a coaching program. They were obviously very, very talented, got gifted talent, and they, they grew up in an environment where they, they could explore themselves and, and became the players that they did and then excel at the levels that they did. So he dig, dug a little bit deep and he wanted to find out, and this was his first the start of it. And as we know, he's made many other books, videos and DVDs. So when I came in touch with that book, I started to basically try out everything that he did in the book. And basically they were all, and Tom will know that, they were just pictures, pictures of moves. Look, sequences of four. This is what you do. Step one, step two, step three, step four. And this is how you try to, 
to use and learn those moves. I went through all of them and I thought, hmm, I'm quite handy with it. And it, you know, the level where I was playing, I started to get some success with it. And then I started to teach those young kids at six, seven, eight years of age when I was only 16, 17. And I thought, this is the way forward. 100% the way forward. There's no other way about it. So that was the biggest starting point, you know, for me on my journey as, as, a, as a coach. And I never deviated away from it. And like everything, everywhere you go in coaching, you know, if you want to be uh, serious about your job, you need to do your coaching qualifications, you need to do your badges, and I'm sure that they've grown and developed. The only thing was that in years gone by, every country had sort of its own ideas and philosophy. If you would go to the Dutch FA, they would advocate, you know, play 4-3-3, keeping and moving the ball and this and that, the other. And that's the identity of what the Dutch have sort of progressed with. You know, if you would go to England in the early, in the early days, it was more 4 4 2, hit the channels and get the ball in the box. Germany, very clinical, very organized, very pragmatic. You go to Brazil, wasn't really any coaching curriculum. You just turn up on, on, the, on the Copacabana in your speedo. And if you, had, if you didn't have a trick, you could go home. And that's culture. Culture is a big thing. But nowadays, nowadays, football is global. There's no secrets anymore. With, with the technology that we've got, you know, the, 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 the tools that we've, we've all got, it's, it's, it's global. And the exposure that you see soccer every day on TV of the best leagues, the best players, will tell you. And that was basically the starting point, you know, from, from Curvis' uh, uh, philosophy, basically. Look at the best teams, look at the best players. Try to analyze their qualities. If you know what the qualities are that they make the difference, then this is what we need to develop. The key, Dennis, is to transfer that into the development in, into a development model. I'll we'll come back to that in a second. So that was that was me in, in Holland and Bergen. I, wa I wanted to obviously to progress on. I wanted to go uh, to go on, and um, I did my sort of youth coaching badges in Holland. Uh, I did the uh, the basic qualifications, but I knew it was going to be difficult for me if I ever wanted to earn earn my uh, my living in football and I wanted to do the professional course I had to probably go a different route there was a lot of a lot of uh, you know politics going on in the background uh, with with the Dutch FA so to speak uh, and if you didn't play you know uh, at a high you know professional level at a high level for a number of years it would be difficult to to go to the school so I went to England you know to do my badges there as well and it was in that time in 93 that I met up with, with Will Curver. So what I did uh, as part of my study, uh, I entered the, the CEOs, which is the Central Institute of Sports in Holland. Um, at the latter, you know, I was, I was in my twenties already, but I, I, luckily I was able to enter, you know, that course. And part of my final studies was I made a video, a 20 minute video that basically explained what I felt, what Will Curver stood for, what he was wanting to try to achieve with his method and how you should take it on board as a young coach, you know, and transfer to young players. That video eventually I managed, um, you know, to, uh, to get it to Will Curver and he invited me for a, for a conversation. And that ended up in him inviting me to go and join him in Qatar. He was working there at the time. He came from the UAE. He's made again another set of DVDs. He was going, going on to do it, to do it again in Qatar and, and that for me was probably the most inspirational and experience I had as a coach working with Will Curver every single day. You have to Im uh, uh, imagine he was 69, 70, turning 70 that time. And in Qatar, you know, as we know, it's always most of the time very, very hot. So we would go out six, seven o'clock in the morning, walk to the stadium and then we'd practice, you know, for two hours. He would, he would let me, he would help me do all sorts of things. Uh, at one point, even I had to I had to help him to get into the stadium to climb over a wall. So I had to throw a 70-year-old over the wall <laughs> to get to the training pitch. But it was amazing because Will Curve over time received a lot of unfair criticism, in my opinion, because I do think that had nothing to do with what he had to offer. But people were scared in many ways of him because he was critical of those coaches that wouldn't embrace it or not have a go at it to making sure that we have an obligation for young kids to teach all those 
skills that make those great players great players. And we need to teach that those young. So we need to, as association, we need to develop more technical creative coaches. Anyway, uh, that, was, uh, that was in Qatar from 93 onwards. I worked with him for over four years. We then carried on back to the Emirates uh, with another club. I stayed in Qatar to work with the, with the, with the, the Qatar Football Association. Um, that is also where I established some more relationships in England um, with, uh, you know, a guy called Dave Richardson. And Dave Richardson was the sort of guy that was put in place by the FA by looking after all the new established academies by Howard Wilkinson. They had to tick all certain boxes. And um, I knew Dave from, from a course and he basically saw, you know, a big you know, a, a missing point in all the academies, there was no, no technical development taking place. Yeah, all the clubs invested in, in facilities, fantastic fields, indoor facilities, but no technical skill work. So he was very big in trying to get me over to England, but that never happened until one day he rang me and he said, Les Kershaw from Manchester United has, uh, has contacted me and uh, he, likes to have, he likes to meet you when you come to England. He said, yeah, that's fine, not a problem. Um, so I obviously developed a few presentations and uh, we, uh, Will Kerf and I, we just finished the new DVD set, The Creative Dribbler, uh, again, with all young Qatari kids. Um, and it was all about, again, dominating 1v1 and linking the passing together and the finishing and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that was, um, that was an important part. And another important part for me was that uh, whilst I was in Qatar working, there was um, uh, the national team coach for the under 17s at the time was Dave Mackay. I don't know if you guys <clears throat> ever heard of him, but Dave Mackay was a big, big player for Tottenham Hotspurs, you know, in the, in the, in the sixties, they, uh, they won, they won uh, the titles, FA Cups, uh, whatever. It was a big player from Scotland, hard as nails, but a very, very, very good player. And uh, I found out later, only later, that Ferguson rated Dave Mackay. If he would have to put the best 11 in of all time, he would put Dave Mackay in his team. So there was a bit of a relationship there. But I came to England to meet Dave Richardson and I stayed at Dave Mackay. And eventually I met Les Kershaw from Manchester United. And Dave, Dave Mackay found out and he basically rang Sir Alex Ferguson and said, listen, you know, uh, I've got this young coach here. I've worked with him in Qatar. I know you guys are looking for a technical skills coach. I can recommend it. So that was great. So by that time, I was back in Qatar, and then Dave rang me one night, and he says, uh, I, and I, you know, he wouldn't ring me, but the one thing that I always knew about Dave was that he was always taking a mickey out of things when I went to visit him. So he rang me, and he says, has Sir Alex Ferguson rang you? And I started laughing. And I said, no, but it's funny you're asking me. I just hang up on Prince Charles. And he started laughing. And he says, no, 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 I'm, I'm serious. I've just spoken to him 15 minutes ago, and he was going to ring you. And I said, all right, well, he hasn't rang. He says, but have you given him the right number? Because last time I came to visit you, I told you in Qatar, they added an extra five to their local numbers. Oh, well, that must be it. Da, 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 da. And indeed, five minutes later, Sir Alex Ferguson rang me. Well, that's an experience. If you first see a person that you only see on TV and you know how big he is and the success he's had and, you know, hello, Renny, Sir Alec Ferguson here. Right, okay, what do you, what do you say? And anyway, uh, we had a 20-minute conversation, uh, basically because obviously he's spoken to Dave McCarr. He says, I would love to invite you to come to Manchester United. We've got these academies, but we need people like yourself to, to inject it with that technical skills work. Anyway, so... That was my journey from coming from a very tiny, small village, meeting up with Wheel Curver, going to Qatar, working there with Wheel, you know, seeing it firsthand how important it was. I, I, I just sat to Wheel all the time and says, we are, we are dragging kids here from almost a non-soccer environment and look what we can achieve. And I share something with you because it's interesting. Wheel and I, we, we did one month, we said, we need to do a little bit of a test to see what, what is the difference in what the rest of the world is. He said, what do you, what do you, what do you mean? I said, well, we, we, we train the way that we do. It's all skill development orientated. It's all about dominating 1v1. It's all about small-sided games. And it's all about 1v1, 2v2, 3v3, 4v4, 
2v1, 3v2, 4v3. And then we build it up to the bigger numbers. And he says, but we giving those kids all the skills. He says, what do you want to do? He says, well, let me, let me explain. One month, you keep training with your players like you do. I take half of the players and I go back to what we think what normally happens. No skill development. It's all based on passing. No skill development whatsoever. We did it for a month. So basically, I had to turn that other group almost away, you know, from. And you talk about kids between the ages of 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That, that age band. After a month, we did a festival over three days. We played, we played uh, small-sided games. We played, uh, like I said, the 2v2s, 3v3s, 4v4s. We played uh, 3v2s, 4v3s. And the next day we played 5v5s, up to 7v7, up to 9v9s. Certain time frames on it, this and that and the other. It was not about, it was not about winning, not for the kids. We just let them play, but we, obviously we kept score. In all those games we played, small to big, my group did not win one game. Not one game. And the only thing that Curva said to their boys is, listen, we are technically very good. We can get ourselves out of any, any situation that will occur. Whether there's somebody put pressure on us, we turn away with an outside hook or a coif turn or a stop turn, we get out of trouble. If we find ourselves in a 1v1, we can take them on and go past them. One single scissor, sidestep, step overs, whatever it is. But when we play in games and you see players in a better position and you don't have them, pass it. Just pass it. No problem. Because what's the quickest way to get a goal when somebody's free? Pass it. That's the only thing he said. The other thing he said is if Rene's teams lose the ball, yeah, or we lose the ball and they've got it, we're going to press them straight away because they can only get out of trouble through passing and movement. They don't have any tricks. They're not good enough. So we win the ball back. That for me, that for me was such an enormous statement on what we were trying to do. And basically, if you look and analyze, and I'll come to that in a minute, if you analyze the really top, top teams and, and the way that they play the game, 90% or 95% is based on one-touch football, quick combination plays and movement. The other 10%, or nine, eight, whatever, 5%, depending on how many players you've got, is decided by the individual skill of your top players. And that is making the biggest difference. So the teams that have those players within their ranks, players that can't dominate the 1v1, and the more you have them, the more you, know, you, will, you will looking to get success because you always can get out of trouble. You can always hurt opposition because of the skill sets that you have. Now, so um, that's me from, from Qatar. Obviously in Qatar, I had, when we left, I had a spell as a manager as well with two teams, which was good because that gave me the opportunity to, to, to transfer, uh, as Tom said, worked at every level with young players, with adult players, to try to transfer that skill set, those levels into the 11-11 situation where results matter. Yeah, because that is the, uh, that is the important thing. And then obviously my journey started at Manchester United. And again, it started at the beginning. Like I started in Qatar, I started with the young kids, I worked my way up, all the way up. In Qatar, I started as a skills development coach, working with development centers, advanced centers, educating coaches, educating parents, worked my way up, started to work individually with first team players, got the reserve team, you know, with the team that I had at that time with uh, Jared PK, Johnny Evans, Jepper Rossi, even Solskjaer played in that, in, in, in that team many times and we won the trouble with that. And, and then after that, I went on to become the first team coach of Manchester United. And then I could really put the whole jigsaw puzzle together. Yeah. But the key is, and that is the most important message I'm already starting to give you now, is the foundation stage is the most important one. I'm going to share with you where, where sort of my philosophies come from and how that refers to a, a talent identification and how the talent identif identification refers back to a development model. And in that development model, and in, in Houston Dynamo, with, together with Tom, they have started a fantastic project, Soccer Starts at Home. That is, that is the most important part. But 
the next part is equally so important to making sure that that is being carried on by you guys, by you coaches, to making sure that you understand it and create the right environment for those kids to technically develop to such an extent. Now, a lot of players have come through that Manchester United development program, but we, you, you watch Manchester United play and the ones that are still now, like Rashford and Greenwood and McTominay, they have come right through that development pro uh, program, right through. And all of them are in their own right very, very skillful when it comes down to dealing with 1v1 situations. Right. So what I'd like to do with you is uh, now share the screen and um, see if I can get this. We can all see this? Yes, we got it. Right. See, I, I, Paul, and especially for you, I put the logos in there as well. <laughs> I hope you appreciate that. <laughs> good, but, good. Uh, Good. Now, the most important thing is, is obviously that um, we're going. So, the journey. So, the, as a coach, it's very, very important because every coach of you guys that start the journey, you will be influenced of information that will be given to you by state federations, by football federations, and all that. And it's the same with me when I went to Holland. And I thought to myself... I've always been, critical is not the right word, but I thought of, you know, it's not like that I take everything for granted, what they say, and especially not after I read Will Curver's book. And basically, if you look that, to that soccer ball in the middle, it's all been padded up by flags around the world, which I mean is, I've looked at basically every aspect in football, what was out there. So I made an analysis. That was my first step. I says, I need to analyze. And the second step, obviously, was I need to analyze. I need to analyze the top teams. I looked at every the highest leagues in the world. I looked at World Cup competitions where the best countries. I looked at who won the World Cup, who was second. I looked at European competitions. You can look at the Copa de Libertadores, all the big international leagues. Then I looked at all the the, the strongest club leagues there are. You got the Champions League. Then you got the Premier League. The Premier League, as you guys say, you got the La Liga, you got the Bundesliga. All those are looked at. And what I found is it's like a pyramid. You know, there's only one team at the top. There's only one team that can win things. So if you look at all those winners at all those different pyramids, you ask yourself, why were they the best teams? What were the qualities? So there's loads of those qualities. And one of those qualities is that they have all top players. And some of those top players, or in those top teams, are players that are world-class. The ones that I mentioned before in the past, but also you look at now, you look at Cristiano Ronaldo, you look at Messi, you look at Neymar, you look at Mbappe, you look at Thiago, you look at Salah, you look at, you can go on and on. It's all those players, yeah, that making the difference. Yeah, also even, so you look at, so I made an analysis of top teams, and then next one, I made an analysis of those world-class players. So what I did, I made a list and I put defenders, midfielders, attackers. You can also do it for goalkeepers, of course, but it's a different, a different uh, uh, part of it. But you look at defenders, midfielders, attackers, you name all of them in the past and you name the current top players. And then on the next sheet, you start to write down all the qualities that those players possess. So there you are in my analysis from top teams and top players. I know now what a top team should look like how do they play? How do they defend? What are they doing in transition? What are they doing in the build-up? What are they doing in the attacking side? And I also know now that those players make a difference and I need to know what qualities make them world-class. If I know that, the next thing for me then is to put that in a development model. Because like every kid that goes to school and learns to, 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 to read, you first learn the letters, then a word, then a sentence, and then you start to read. In football, it's not any different. But how much can you already do, you know, with your young children at home before they come into the development model? And that is where I refer to before with Tom, you know, soccer starts at home because the entry level will be higher. But you people, we people that worked in the development model, it is very important that we know, and we know from the analysis what we want to develop. The next thing is, 
you need to understand how you transfer that to your age that you're working with and the stage that the players are in. Because as we all know, coaches that work with kids that are eight, nine or 10 years of age are differently when you work with 16, 17, 18 year olds. Yeah, it's the same thing with teachers that work in the schools. So if we know that, I also know then what I need to do in training. I know exactly because of my analysis where the emphasis is at. So if I am working at a very young age in my de development model, yeah, I know exactly what age and stage I'm working in. Let's say I work with eight-year-olds. The training is very much focused on individual development. If I'm now a coach that works with 18-year-olds and we come to the end of the development model, my focus is much more on the individual development, but also on the team development because they're starting to play. They're playing 11 aside. They're competing for, you know, for whatever, for competitions and trophies. So this then is always referred to the matches those kids are going to play. Young kids will play small-sided games. If you get up to 16 and beyond, it becomes bigger and it gets to 11 v 11. And when you come to the final bit, let's say the 18-year-olds, you play 11 v 11, you then again go back to the analysis and say, how, how much in that match are we producing what top teams do? Right? So this is basically the seven steps, the key steps that sort of revolve around my philosophy. Now, as we know, and Tom highlighted, I was fortunate to work, you know, at Manchester United in a fantastic period between 2007 and 2013. Um, the, the result of that is, is that book that I've produced uh, in cooperation with a company called Soccer Tutor. I really recommend you go on to the website, soccertutor.com. They've got plenty more good books. Not only for me, the only difference is that my book is written by myself. The other coaches' books are written by a ghostwriter, but very, very good. Uh, you can read about Pep Guardiola, Klopp, you can read about 352 systems, you can read about periodization, anything. It's a really good way. So for me now, working with world-class players, how can I now transfer all that skill bit into the team Yeah, that needs to win every game and try to win every trophy? And never mind, you know, developing those two. Uh, phenomenal players in Rooney and, and Ronaldo. So the key is also is to have a look at the, you know, the qualities of world-class players, team player identification. What makes a world-class player? Now, <clears throat> there's plenty of other slides that could fill up, but these are the sort of words that spring to mind if you look at and you analyze world-class players. You know, strength, attitude, stamina, team spirit, respect, motivation, Desire, awareness, concentration, speed, fun, determination, skills. I could probably fill up three or four slides of different words that are all important and all have an effect on the development and also the performance of players. But if you look at this slide here, there's a few words that sort of are in the same bracket. You know, if you look at speed, stamina, uh, strength, they're all physical qualities. Yeah, if you look at decision making, awareness, yeah, they're all about, you know, the tactical side. So what I did, I sort of put them in four categories, tactically, and I color coded them. And the reason why I color coded them, and you can see that also on the logo in the top of the screen, I color coded them because colors are such consciously a really powerful tool to help you, you know, to explain things, but also to remember things. So tactically is yellow, physically is red, mentally is blue, and technically is green. So those are the four main development components of a world-class players that need to be developed. So if you look at this picture here, and it's quite a dated picture, but you see here some players that are still playing, Benzema, Ronaldo, Neymar, uh, Messi, Robin is retired now, and all that. But those, this was sort of a, a picture of world-class players, maybe, whatever, 10 years ago. And in their own right, in their own right, they were all world-class and making a difference for the team. So more than others. If you then go a little bit more in detail to say, okay, if this is the central thing, what I did is I built a, a sort of almost a, an identification jigsaw puzzle. 
tactically, it's all about awareness first. So any of those players here, and as an example, I, I pick Ronaldo because I've worked with him. Let's say Ronaldo is in the central of this is the XO piece. And I say, okay, where does Ronaldo make the difference for Manchester United at the time? Later, Real Madrid, now Juventus. Is that in defence or attack? And he does that obviously more in attack, in offence. So my first question is, is Ronaldo aware? So what does he need to be aware about? First of all, about himself. Yeah, how, how, how is he physically? Is he tall? Is he short? Is he slow? Is he quick? All those things, all those attributes, yeah, needs to be aware about. But also about his position. Where does he play? Does he play from the left coming in? Does he play in front? Does he play on the right? Does he, are, is he aware what position and what roles he needs to play when the team is defending? What is his job then? What does he need to do in transition? What does he need to do when we have the ball? So the next question is, does Ronaldo understand how to make a difference for the team? Does he understand his defensive roles? Does he understand what to do in transition? Does he understand when to play the ball one touch, when to run with the ball, when to cross, when to shoot? So if you analyze any of your players, not Ronaldo, any of your players that you know, and you look at them tactically, and basically you have to understand again when in the development model that takes place, and I'll explain that later. But when you look at senior players or players on their 18s and beyond, and you say, that, that player is tactically really, really good. He's got really good awareness and understanding. Then this is the component that stands out, the decision-making. World-class players always or most of the time make the right decisions. That is one of the outstanding qualities. If you look at a physical component, then there's a lot of things have changed over the last 30 years. But you look at all those players now at the top, top level, and let's say in the Premier League, they all have peak fitness. And everything that really supports that peak fitness needs to be developed. Whether it's the right diet, the right sleeping pattern, strength and conditioning, whatever that goes into it to help them peak fitness. But when I analyze Ronaldo physically on the pitch, playing in a game, how does he make the difference? Then he makes the difference by those four components. Pace, yeah, can he outrun people? Strength, does he get knocked off the ball or does he knock people off the ball? Stamina, can he, can he last for 90 minutes plus? And his agility, how quickly is he in his movements? And I think we could, it's fair to say he ticks all the boxes. If you look to the mental component, then all those players in that picture, but everybody on this call, we all have our own personalities. And it, it's very interesting sometimes to dive into that because I think there's somewhere about 16 different personalities. And the reason why I say it, as a coach, to try to get kids and players respond, you need to understand how they learn. Some learn by just listening to you. Some learn by watching. Some learn by doing things. It's a cocktail of all those things that you need to know. It's what they say, this guy is very, very good because he knows exactly which buttons to press. You can only press the right buttons if you understand the personalities of people. Very simple example. One of those personality traits is you've got kids or players that are introvert and some are extrovert. If you as a coach say, are there any questions? It's always the same kids that put their hand up because they're extrovert. They're not afraid to speak in the open. And, and let their voices be heard. The introvert kids, they still have questions, but they don't want to ask it in front of anybody else. So you need to have a different approach. Yeah, so some kids, they do things purely by intuition. Other ones want to think about it. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. You can Google that as well, you know, personality traits and, and how that refers to sports. It's a really interesting one. But going back to Cristiano, mentally, how does he dominate? his position and what he does on the pitch. Yeah. And that shows in the, in, in these two things, the winning mentality and the attitude in the way that they step on the pitch. And that shows mainly through the confidence they show when they're playing. So if I see Cristiano play, I see a very confident player. Then the last bit is basically back to the whole curve uh, uh, aspect. All those players, and to be able to play good soccer, you need to have good basic skills. Yeah, you need to be able to pass, receive, shoot, cross the ball, and when you get older, hat the ball as well. 
But to be really, really able to dominate the 1v1 or be unpredictable in attacking play and cause a lot of trouble and creating chances of scoring goals, you need to have these moves, turns and tricks of your own. Yeah, functional moves and turns to get you out of trouble or maybe creative moves and creative tricks, whatever you call them. That, that needs to be there. So if you look at this screen now, is that yellow, red, blue and green colours the things in the corners are the ones that you can see, they're tangible. When I watch players and analyze players perform, I can see those things in the corners. They are the ones that makes the difference in the games. That whole jigsaw is basically a, an x-ray of a world-class player. And those things need to be developed at a young age. The key now is, how do we do that? How do we, how do we develop this picture because you cannot do everything at the same time because an eight year old physically is completely different than an 18 year old. So it's all about like going to school is putting the right emphasis at the right times. So if you look behind that jigsaw puzzle and you go really to let's say 16 year olds, 18 year olds and beyond, you can really look in detail what what's behind those uh, pieces you know so tactically for instance you know it's all about decision making as we said you have a defensive side you have an attacking side these were the parameters that we used at Manchester United this is how we looked at our squad this is how we looked at potential players bringing in this is how we sort of scouted our next players but also it is the basis of the development model which I want to share with you now yeah so if this is the picture of the top top player it's also the start of the player development so if you look at player development and we look at the things we need to develop then we think about those things yeah on the left hand side you see the basic things passing receiving running with the ball and shooting on the right hand side you see the dominating the 1v1 scenarios the moves the skills components with the opponent on the side opponent coming from an angle opponent in front of you or in behind this is basically the whole technical development aspects that needs to be developed over time through the development player development model. So if I then say, okay, this is the basis. Let's have a different look at it. And we put them on top of the screen. The first thing that we need to do as a club or organization or wherever you are as a coach, you need to create the right environment in the club, in training and in games that those four components can be developed at the right time. I put lifestyle in there because if you see here when the ages come in and you've got when kids get registered at clubs or most of the time, then it starts at six and it carries on to 18. And as I said, wanted to say before, there's a window before six and that's where Tom comes in with soccer starts at home as early as two, three years of age. And that means that if those kids do really great stuff at home with the parents, there's so many benefits going with it that the kids, when they come in at six, that have got a far higher entry level. The other problem is on the other end of the development model, 18, is where, is where players, where you need to create a bridge and a pathway for those kids to get into senior football, you know, but because of the demands, especially in the Premier League, a lot of young players cannot make that step, not because they're not good enough, it's just because they're not given any opportunity. So there's another window for me between 19 and 23 that is also part of the final. But this is the biggest, the biggest thing. You see the word lifestyle in there and that's right above 13, 14 and 15. And the reason why I do it is that lifestyle in the early ages from 6 to 12 to 13 is basically managed by the home environment you know mom and dad the carers whoever looks after them school etc but also the club when the kids get 13 14 15 they start to take ownership about that lifestyle and it's important that they do the right things that it doesn't have a negative influence on their development let's have a closer look so we know from the analysis that the technic the technical side is so important so we focus on technique in the early parts of that development I want coaches there that can teach that technique in the right environment when the kids are six, seven, eight, and nine. They've done the soccer starts at home. 
what is what is the environment that I, I, I create in training? What is the environment I create in game scenarios? I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. So that technical development start developing and never stops. There's just different emphasis as we get along. Tactically, in those early stages, not much information, hardly any. It's not important for that for those kids. The only thing that need the kids to understand, be aware and understand is enjoy yourselves and do as much with the ball as you can do. Physically, everything that is physically trainable will be linked in with the technical development, balance, coordination, agility. Yeah. Mentally, there are a few things that are important, like fun. Yeah. Like learning, uh, exploring new things, um, you know, take an initiative, be creative, all the things come in. The technique is basically it's something you do in isolation. Yeah, so in other words, I can have a young, a young player, seven years of age, and I can say, can you do a stop turn? And say, yes, fantastic. And can you do a step over? Yes. Can you do a Cruyff turn? Yeah. Now, the key is, and that is not as black and white as it's in the model, because it's an ongoing process, but you want to take the technique into skill. And technique becomes a skill if you can do, if you can uh, execute that technique under certain stress, like time, space, or opponents, then it becomes a skill. Yeah, and that is what, again, the environment you need to create. And you can see the yellow bit kicks in. So now I need coaches that understand which techniques have been taught and how they can challenge that for the players now in a different environment and how the kids can implement that skill into small-sided games. And again, 1v1, 2v2, 3v3, 4v4, 2v1, 3v2, 4v3. Why up to 4v4 in the early stages? Because in 4v4, it still has the two main aspect, tactical aspects of width and depth. If you go 3v3, you're missing something. You miss depth or you, or you miss width. It's impossible. So 4v4 has got everything. Football and coaching and training is all about repetition and success. Yeah? So the kids want to do it over and over again. So if you want to teach kids technique and you've got 20 players, you got only one ball, there's not going to be much uh, technical uh, development taking place. Yeah? But if you give every kid a ball, they've got 100% repetition because they work with a ball and they do their skills. If you have only 10 balls, you have to share it. Me and Paul share a ball. It goes half, 50%, because if Paul has the ball, I haven't got it. So I can't do nothing. Yeah? So coaching is all about repetition and success. And it's a flowing things. Yeah, it's an ongoing things. The reason why you want to play games 2v1, 3v2, 4v3 is to make the kids aware that they start to understand subconsciously when to dribble or when to pass. Because they can see we've got an extra player. Yeah, and they find out with us without us telling us, telling them, they need to sort of look at the environment and try to you know, discover it by themselves. Because if they do, it's by far more powerful than we as coaches tell them. Then we carry on and you see that yellow, the yellow beam comes in and you see that's where the introduction, the tactical introduction comes in of time and space, width and depth, defend and attack, etc. Switching play, all those things come in. The physical side, you see, uh, at 13, obviously, you see a lot of things happening. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that means that there's a lot of changes taking place. That's also the ages where you see kids who are already very tall and you see kids that are still very tiny and very small. So now to, full, to fulfill that development model, we want to take that skill into strategy. And in that period of 11, 12, that's where the identity of the player comes out. That's where we know where they're going to be defenders, midfielders, forwards. That's also when they start moving on and play by far bigger games. Yeah, all the way up to 6v6, 7v7, 9v9, into 11v11. And the, the bigger we go, the more complex it gets, the more things come into it, and the more they need to start uh, to be aware and understand how that skill element relates to their specific position in the pitch. So now I need a coach that can coach that skill into strategy that can implement that skill into 11 v 11. But also the last bit is that little bit of blue tactic, ta uh, mental side 
is dark blue. And the reason why is because there's always a misunderstanding because a lot of times coaches, there's been an environment where the coaches use the kids to win games and be successful. So it made him look good. But winning should never be an obstacle for kids' development. Yeah? But that doesn't mean that the kids cannot play to win. Every kid, every team, you give them 4v4, give them a ball, and they will compete. That's fine. But development as a coach is, can I help the kids to play in a certain way and use the skills so they get a higher chance of winning? That's different than for me putting the, the, the tallest kids up front and the kid, and the, and the, and the, the kid with the biggest shot at the back hoof it up the park and then try to score a goal where I need to learn the kids to play out from the back and use the skills. I hope you get that point. So this is an overview now is where I drag that jigsaw puzzle out of each other. And this is just a, a little overview. So if you work in a club setting, every coach is in that development, in that, in that setup should understand this picture, no matter where they work. And then the next thing is, is to making sure that they need to understand what they're doing, where the emphasis are. In the beginning, is filling up that skills box in Houston Dynamo, they call it skill builders, which I like that word. But at the same time, it's developing that attitude, confidence, taking initiative, being creative, enjoy it. You know, have a lot of fun by learning those new things and try to put them into the games in that small sided game setup. Later on, after 12, like I said, more and more they start to specialize and more and more they start to put it into the 11v11. So if we have this and then say we work in window of opportunities. So this is the key now to making sure that you've got the right people working at this window. Coaches that really good with six, seven, eight, nine years of age. And Tom is an expert in it. There's not, not, not nothing else all his life. He knows. And it's, it's a way of how do you speak to those kids? What environment do you create based on repetition and success? Folks not teaching that technique. How do you do that? There's a structure behind it. That's the most important thing. So this is the environment you want to create, where it's fun, where they learn a lot and learn new things, where they play a lot and where they experience a lot of success. That's how an environment at that age should look like in training and in the games. Now, I'm the coach that works in the next window. So I know exactly what's been taught. I need to create an environment now is where those 10, 11, 12 year olds in the ideal world can be really creative, constantly dominating 1v1s, dribbling, taking players on, challenge the kids in all different ways, make him aware about time, space, defending, attacking, width and depth. Yeah, but still again, it's all about developing confidence, creative players. The more success, the more confident, the more the kids will come out of that and, 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 uh, and, and develop their personality traits as well. The third window is what I call the, the window of unrest. This is where some kids start to struggle because of physical changes, you know, but when the basis is good, it's fine. That skill element will be there. Subconsciously, it will be there. Now we need to have a good look at the lifestyle of everybody, of all the kids, and educate them in there how important good food is, you know, good sleep is you know, training, etc. So now we're starting to put that skill into the bigger games, bigger possessional games, bigger condition games. All that skill is related to, to mean something. We need to implement it. It has an end product, yeah? So you start and see more technical input, more tactical input, and more physical uh, emphasis as well. And you can see the end of the window by 15, 16, yeah, there is a, an element of competing. We want to win, no problem at all. But first and foremost, we want to perform well. And then the last window is where everything needs to come together. This coach in the ideal world has got kids in every position that know what they are from defense, midfield and attack. And they're all very, very good in terms of their individual skill and how to handle it in the different positions. And you can see now that the colors are all dark and equally important. So basically, and it's a long, a long, a long chat, but Paul and, and Tom and I have discussed this before. Um, and it's a, a long listen, but looking at all the questions that I've got in front of me, 
I think rather than going about them individually, uh, we decided for me to do this presentation so you guys have a good idea, one, about my journey. How did it get there? Secondly, about how did I build my philosophy, you know, on the basis of common sense, on the basis of analysis of top teams, world-class players. And the next thing is player identification and how you transfer that into development model. So I just start, stop, stop sharing the screen for a moment. So I think uh, I, I go back a little bit to Paul because you all guys have been listening. There's maybe some questions has come in. But just to finish off before I give it to Paul, there's much more detail to it. When you've got the overviews, you then need to go into the detail. Now, if I would go into the detail with you, I don't know if you guys have a week, but then we will still sit here next week. So maybe we need to do some more of these you know, Zooms or webinars. But like I said, I hope you have a good idea because this is exactly what I've implemented in my time at Manchester United when I joined in 2001 and all the players that came through it not always uh, managed to get into the Manchester United first team. But like I said, the likes of uh, Marcus Rashford, Mason Greenwood, uh, yeah, Scott McTominay, all of them have come through this process. All of them from the age of six, five, six year old. Over to you, Paul. But you need to mute, unmute yourself. <laughs> Thank you, Renee. That was, that was amazing. I uh, really, really enjoyed that. Um, yeah, there's so much that we could we could kind of dive in. A lot of questions uh, that come to mind. I, I see, you know, um, you know, a couple in the chat, and also, you know, um, you know, in speaking with Sanjeev, Sanjeev had some great questions as well. This one is really interesting, that I think might be worth exploring and asking is that that concept of individual development once you get into the team right and you get into the group context so you know there you know it's it's a buzzword right individual development there's so much talk about this which is which is key right is improving the individual what are the ways that you did that at manchester united academy or maybe in qatar in regards to the young players through those phases uh, if you if you go back to the um to the, to the development model, as you've seen, you look, especially in the first and two windows, the first two windows. And like I said, in the ideal world, you want to, you want to, get, you want to get access at Adam at six and seven. And what happened at Manchester United was when it got there, uh, at that time, there was a particular rule that every club, and there was to sort of protect the sort of, uh, or manage the competition, so to speak, uh, that clubs could only scout within an hour and a half you know, of, of their parameters. But that rule is now gone. But at the time when I was there, that was still there. But um, so what United had, we had about 20 what we call development centers in and around the, the Manchester area. And that was basically logistically for parents not to travel more than 15 minutes. The other logistic challenge with that was that every development center had about two, two coaches and one or two scouts. So all together, you talk about close to 60 to 70, 80 people that I sort of had to, to help to sort of, because the problem was before everybody did their own thing in the development centers. It was not streamlined. So I had to educate them to making sure that they understood the whole picture and eventually that they, they understood that they were working in the first window. And although, although uh, especially with the young age, it is individual development, but it's sort of still in a sort of almost a group setting. I wouldn't say a team setting, but a group setting. And that's why a lot of those individual development at the early stages is all done by a lot of the players having their own ball, yeah, doing their own thing, you know, because again, it takes, it takes, it takes, uh, you know, it takes touches when. When, how long, how long does it take for the kids? But it goes, it goes very, very quick, as Tom will tell you. But they need, uh, again, kids need to have, what do you call it? One, you learn, you teach them something new, the kids experience it. First and foremost, what you need to do is, you show this is how it's done. That's it, a picture. Let them show it, this is how it's done. But if you then see kids struggling with it, you must have the ability as a coach to then approach that, that kid individually and personally and need to break it down in steps. So if I, for instance, do a step over and I, let's say I do a step over this way and turn the other way around, 
you know, one of the common mistakes is that kids do a step over and they don't know that turn away from the ball, they turn with the first step, you know, and some kids haven't got it straight away, but that, that's a coordinational thing. If they don't, you have to stop it and break it down in four steps. No more than that. Just four steps. Step one, this is what the do. This is what you do with the ball. Step over the ball. Now you turn the other way and then you take it away. That's, a, that's part of that individual process. But it's a constant ongoing process from addressing the kids in a group setting, help them individually, set them in a group setting in small-sided games. Just let them get on with it because, listen, it doesn't you don't get you don't achieve perfection after one training session you know or after one week or it's an ongoing process you learn you teach them something new you you revisit it the next day or whatever you train again you add something to it and then you put it into a game situation where the kids can just have a, have fun with it yeah then you go on and the more the kids go through that process of adding learning something new experiencing playing games and then bit by bit then it start the process they start to understand. And when the kids go from six to nine, the progress they can make is immense, is unbelievable. I've already seen little videos uh, since, since, since Tom start, started that project of uh, Soccer Stars at Home of little kids as old as three years. You see him week one, they just nearly fall over the ball. You see them a month later or two months later and it's tippy-tappy, tippy-tappy, now it's flowing. That's how quick it can go if it's addressed in the right way. But it's always an ongoing process. Information in group settings and making sure that you have individual attention for those that need it. That's awesome. Um, you know, you see a lot of, uh, you know, individual coaches now, right? That are working on a technical level with the players. Um, and you see how, how how well those players can develop when they're given that individual attention, right? And then once you get into a team coach, which are a lot of coaches on here are the team coaches, right? It, it, the, the trick seems to be really, can you maintain that level of, of contact with the players? So I've heard different things from different clubs about, you know, flight patterns where you're, you're able to speak with the individual throughout the training and how important that is. But also what I'm hearing from you is that, that technical detail because you can do a lot of technical training, but unless maybe there's that fine eye of the technical coach to see that this can improve a little bit or your, your foot can be positioned this way or those four steps that you did with Veal Corver. I mean, Veal Corver and yourself, I mean, we're improving individuals every single day, right? On these little levels that are different than just doing a technical session in a big group without the, the interaction with the individual player. I think that's a big distinction of, you know, really, you know, great development and maybe just doing, you know, a technical type session. Um, here's another question um, that, that's interesting from Gareth. What are your thoughts on the transition moment from 7v7 to 9v9 to 11v11 with regards to the correct age to do that and ways to adapt the space during that transition? One of the issues I see in the United States is a rush to transition to 9v9 or 11v11 at earlier ages and the fact that it creates a false sense of space, benefits players that are more physically developed and eliminates the challenge of the players solving problems in tight spaces. It's a really, really good question and I, and I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and, and as you know, when I joined Manchester United, they, at the ages of uh, eight years of age, they were, uh, I have to think now, they were playing 9v9 of 8v8. Yeah, it was 8v8. 8v8 and 9v9. So I tried to explain the coaches and the parents. I said, listen, from the analysis, it's not, it's not that I've come up with it. It's just common sense. From the analysis, it shows that those players with that individual skill are the ones that are making, are making a difference because they've got more, more skill sets to deal with those 1v1 situations. If I, want, if I create an environment in training where I have every player have got a ball and I get maximum repetition, I create that maximum repetition in small-sided games, as I mentioned to you before, 1v1 all the way up to 4v4, because I want those kids 
to practice. And then suddenly, on a Sunday in the game day, it goes to 8v8 and 9v9. 15 players on the pitch, one player's got the ball, and 15 haven't got it. You tell me where that, where that success and the progress is going to come on for, for those kids to try to implement that skill into a game situation as 8v8. It's impossible. So what they did is, with all the different age groups, and it's also about the, the, the sizes. So I came up with that, the, the 4v4 format that we've run for um, since I was there and Manchester uh, University did a, with uh, Rick Finolio did a whole um, research on it, you know, and what the benefits uh, were from it. And I can show you that a little bit in the presentation in a minute. And the outcome was unbelievable. And maybe if I can bring it up quickly, that maybe makes it even more uh, challenge of uh, interesting for uh, the things. Let me hear. How can I <clears throat> go back to? Here we go. Uh, oh, where's my? Uh, I just want to bring this back up. So. In that young, in those younger age groups, we can all see this, eh? Yep. So in this younger age group, from six to nine, yeah, I came up with four, with four, four v four games between the ages of six and nine instead of eight v eight. So you had a goalkeeper game, and basically every game, without the coach's influence, just the explanation explained. The kid, so what, what do we want to get out of this 1v1? We want to be the player and have a shot. That's what we want in this game, yeah? If we played on two small goals or cones as goals, as you can see in the picture, then it's all about keep moving the ball because if you shoot from a distance, the chances that you're going to miss the goal are quite big. So you need to try to get as close to the goal as you can. So combination play is important. Bringing the ball back out is important and changing direction is important. The third goal was on four small goals, where it's all about, you know, changing, changing the play, switching the play. And the last one was all about line ball and it's all about being direct. Have you got the ball? Can you run with players? Go past them. Those were the four games. Here they are again on the pitch. The interesting bit of the sizes of the pitches with these ages is nothing else than... If you put a player, let's say, on the picture on the left with the goals, and I would have him just standing, let's say, five yards away from the goal, or a half, sorry, 10 yards. If he could then, with a shot from the halfway line, reach the goal, yeah, then you've got the right distance. Yeah, that's how simple we did it. If he, if he would stand on the sideline and he could switch the play from right to left, you would have the right width. That's how we sort of calculated the distances of those of those pitches accordingly to six, seven, eight, nine years of age. Forget this. If you then look to the benefits that came out, then these were the things that you saw. Instead of 8v8, the number of passes increased to 135%. The number of 1v1 duels, 225%. The number of moves and skills, 280% up comparison to 8v8. The number of goals scored, 500%. So the two things that you see here is, is repetition and success. Exactly what I want to create in training, I want to create in games. The 4v4s gave us that. So just look at, 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 at uh, England and the uh, United States, not any different because of sometimes of the distances, they have to travel, yeah, three, four, five hours. That is, that is nothing new for in, in, the, in the United States. But I question those people that had to come from Newcastle, which is about three and a half hours away, to come to play at Manchester United at 11 o'clock. They would, they would have to get up at six, get together at seven, start traveling, three and a half hours in the bus. Then they play 8v8. They bring 16 players. Eight players are playing. Eight players are subs. Coach are playing Manchester United. Oh, we need to do well. We need to play our best players. Of those eight sub players, most likely probably six of them will never come on or maybe play whatever, 10 minutes. Then they go in the bus again, 
travel back three and a half hours. So that's seven hours, eight hours, nine hours traveling of 20, 10 minutes of football. That could never be part of the development, so to speak. So, <clears throat> so what, what, what it is come to back to, Paul, is that there is this individual approach in this group setting in terms of technical development, and, 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 and Tom will reinforce that, it's the most important thing is that coaches need to understand the structure. The structure of how to start teaching kids. Ball mastery. You know, a lot of touches on the ball. Fast feet exercises. Introduction into basic moves. Introduction into moves to faint opponents. And, and you build up and you add and you add. And it's an ongoing process. You add something, you put a game to it where they can explore it and they can express themselves. And you don't go from individual training to 8v8. Doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense because they've got no repetition. They've got no chance to practice. You have to keep it small. So back to the person that asked that question. It's a really good question. And I do feel that too many too early start to play an emphasis 9v9 or 11v11 too early because they are not ready for it. Because also from research, it shows that when the kids get really up to 14, 15, 16, that the tactical information that can, they can take on goes by far quicker if you start early. Yes, with good kids, you can get a good product. You can get them to play the right way because the kids are not daft and they do what they like, but they do it. But basically, you are, you are on the controls. You tell them where to go. You tell them where to pass. That's not, that's not development. That's, that's kids doing because they're told what to do. What you want to do with development is giving kids the right tools in the right environment for them to make their own decision. Because that's what soccer is about when they eventually start to play for their own. Making their own decision. Recognize and making the right decisions and use the skill sets that they've got. But totally agree with regards to the size of the pitches. Just need to unmute yourself again, Paul. <clears throat> have another question here. Thank you for that. Um, question from Jed Davis. What are your thoughts on players playing down age groups in each of the four windows of opportunity? If this is something you might do, for what reasons might you do this and how you might manage it as a tool for player development? Yeah, we, 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 we called it streaming. We did this, we did this in United. And it's a great, uh, great example. What I did again with, with when I came to United to, to prove because from the statistics, it showed very, very clearly in England is still going from the September birthdays where a lot of other countries go from January birthdays, but the conclusions are the same. In England, most of the players entering an academy were from September, October, November, December, January, February. Hardly any for March, April, May, June, July. So my question to those people was, can you not play football in March, April, May, and July? Is that impossible? You go to the other countries that use January da uh, data and the birth date, they had all players coming in January, February, March, April, May, June, July. So there's six months there. And it's basically, and we all know that, when kids are young, yeah, the younger they are, Months and a few months can make a massive difference. Yeah, so a, boy, a kid born, let's say, in January is in the same age group with a kid that is born in November, December. Well, it's nearly a year difference. So what we did at Manchester United at the time to prove that point, I invited 32... Oops, looks like we got frozen, huh? Yep. Just give it a second. I think it'll unfreeze. Rene, if you can hear us, we can't hear you. Let me see. Um, hold on. Frozen as well. I want to. Yeah, we can hear you better. We can hear you, but we it's it's still frozen. It's Am I better. frozen? Yeah. Although I think it's getting better. Yep, you're okay. Oops. I think you're okay. Yeah. Yep. 
just just to just to go back to prove the point. So what I did is in the indoor facility, if I divided the pitch in four small sided pitches, four four v four pitches, in the games that we just sort of saw, and I think it was all it was all four v four with uh, I think with uh, with goalkeepers. Uh, but anyway, thirty two kids. I invited uh, with it. I have to think now. I think sixteen sixteen scouts, and I divided them over those four pitches. In the first round, I played all the, 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 the kids born in January, for, oh sorry, uh, October, November. I played them on pitch A. The ones December, January, February, they played on pitch B. Yeah, a little bit of technical difficulties there, huh? Unfortunately. Hmm. The younger ones after that on pitch C and the young Are we gone, Tom? Yeah, it's 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 it seems like it's better now. Yeah, it's okay. I think we're okay. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. I do know I've been plugged in, so hopefully uh it will yeah. stay. But all those all those kids of different ages of all over twelve months, I divided them over the four pitches. And I had the coaches, the scouts go round. And watch the game every game two minutes. So there's eight minute games. And they then have to give to me on a piece of paper two players that they think were standing out. The next round, I put the, 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 the kids that were born in the first half to six months on one side of the two pitches and the other ones on the other half. Mix them again. Again, same, same round. And the last round, I put the oldest one on pitch A, the second oldest one on pitch B, third oldest on pitch C and the youngest one on pitch D. In the first two rounds, none of the scouts picked up a player from the youngest age groups. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. And also, they only picked out one from the age group above. All the players came from those two groups in the first six months. Yeah. Because they get overpowered and overrun by the players that are physically stronger. So my... Yeah. My conclusion of that is, yes, streaming is important. The, whether you stream down, you know, or if the kid is happy in the age group where he is, you keep him where he is. But if he's better and he can physically handle it and he can mentally handle it, he, you can stream him up. No problem. Yeah, so there's almost three tracks. The one that he should be in, the one below, and the one up. And there's quite a few examples. I mean, Jesse Lingard, for instance, he's one of them that's just gone and joined West Ham. He was a very tiny, tiny player, very skillful. But we kept him, we kept him, you know, below his sort of age groups for quite a while. Because when they get older, and the gap is like this in the beginning, it all comes closer when they get to, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18. And then eventually it all disappears. Yeah. But it's important aspect, streaming. That's, that's, that's great. Um, Okay, so we're, we're closing in on time at 1230. I, I mean, we could go for another hour here, no, no doubt about it. But I know there's a couple things that we want to get to. Um, and if you don't mind running a little bit over, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all good with it as well. It's, it's great to spend this time. Um, so I know one thing, I had two people ask this, so I'm going to ask you. Um, how important is the unopposed versus the opposed work technically? that isolated technical training it, it you know on, on twitter and all these places it's it's always a topic yeah I, I think it's it's quite a silly topic quite honestly um but i i would love for you to answer that question yeah more than more than happy to uh, going back to what i said what what is what are the most important components of training and coaching it's two things is repetition and success Repetition you need to create to making sure that the kids can do it over and over and over again. And depending on the age and the level, you need to again set that environment. Now, if I work with young kids six years of age, they, they first start to come in, the first ever they start doing ball mastery. If I suddenly bring them into an, an environment that's too competitive, too difficult for them, they will have no repetition and no success. Nothing. So I will work with those kids on a post. Because the biggest challenge for them is to master the ball and then go in different directions and touch it with both feet. And if they master that, we go, we go with speed. Can you do it quick? Can you do this? Can you do that? Before you start to entering the opposed. And the opposed one is also part of 
you start, first of all, you start to do sort of semi post, yeah? Players that can shadow. So giving that little bit. And then bit by bit, you, you, you bring up the level to full competition. But it's going phases through because if you don't, if you don't, those kids will never experience any success. And the reason why success is so important, because success will be for the kids that they, they grow and they grow in confidence. Um, and that's so important to experience if they, if they don't do that, because they, they go back. If it's too difficult, kids will go, oh, I can't do that. Forget it. It's too difficult. You know, got no, whatever. So again, it's, it's, a, it's a constant ongoing process, but it's, it's not a problem because those young kids, even you teach them something and you bring it in, 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 a, in a playing, in a playing environment, which is opposed anyway, because those kids, you play four kids, play two V two, throw a ball, boom, let them get on with it. Like I said, even if you work with these kids, and again, it's important what I always call it, the training pizza slices. You know, if you've got a pizza and it's divided in slices, the younger the kids, the more the pieces you have. Small, six, eight minute blocks. You teach them something, boom, you let them play. You teach them again something, you let them play. The older the kids get, the bigger the pizza slices. Because you're working in bigger groups, you're working maybe on possession, you're working on a passing drill, you're working on a finishing drill, whatever it is. Keep it nice and keep it nice and small. Nothing against a post of on a post, uh, especially not in skill development, because they need to get it right. As soon as they can do it, can they do it with two feet? Secondly, thirdly, can they do it with pace? Bang, into in a game situation. Now try it here. And that's the revisiting constant circle you go back. Constantly, constantly. But if you keep doing it, but it also depends on how often do you train with these kids? You train once a week, what will the outcome be? We all know the 10,000 10, rule about being really good at something, doesn't matter what it is, whether it's piano playing or whether it's playing soccer. The more you play, somebody asked in the questions about homework, you know, which is a really good question. Of course, you give homework to the kids. Listen, you go home. You're not become. You're not going to become Ronaldo because you come once a week to our club. You're going to become Ronaldo at home. That's where you become Ronaldo. We can give you something, and you go home and you practice it over and over again in the kitchen. You 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 use a chair or whatever it is. To, to, to do your little drag backs, your, your flick, work with different little balls. And when you come back, the next day we train, I want to see what your progression is. And then we go and work with, if you've got brothers and sisters, play with them. If you've got father, you know, that's the sort of stuff. Homework is very, very important. Very important. You can see if you've got kids and you tell them, listen, we all want to practice it. And like I said, if you're in eight weeks in training, they would have quite a bit of homework because you added new things, and they need to revisit things. And they've got quite an arsenal of different things that you can do with the fast feed. I don't know whether you still do it, Tom, but we started, you know, with, with uh, giving them numbers. You know, you go one, two, three, four, five, six, up to 10 or 12. And then you start combining the numbers. You know, can you do number one is basically the tippy tappy that links everything together. But can you do, what do you call it? Number four is a roller cross with number seven, a drag back. Can you combine them together? That is number number four and number seven, so 47. Can you do number 47, uh, 479, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Go on, Tom. Well, one thing I say, and, and, and Rene, this is where the big disconnect is with the misinterpretation of Will's work, is that there were so many DVDs that were, or, or videos that were created, and they were never created in a way, and I know because I've, I've, I've produced five of my own DVDs, right? So when you create a DVD, and you've done it as well, you, you're not creating a training session DVD. You're creating exercises. So many people got the misinterpretation that Will was just calling for this unopposed, isolated training, one player, one ball, not understanding that, of course, if you're in a proper training session, you're going to have limited pressure, full pressure. So this is where Will has, you know, unfortunately, people got the misinterpretation when they would watch a lot of the Curver videos and they'd think it's just unopposed all the time, but it's not. And, and I, I think that's, that's been a big, big misunderstanding for a lot of people. The other thing is, is that unless you have the repetition, you physically, neuroscientifically, you can't hardwire those, those neural pathways. That has, to be, that has to be successful and it has to be continuous. 
As soon as you stop focusing and doing, whether it's a mental task or a physical task, learning doesn't take place. So that's why the repetition is so key because it's hardwiring. And when nerve cells fire together with other nerve cells, they wire together. And that's why you get that repetition and it gets hardwired so later, those players can use those technical skills in a very automated, automatic, unconscious process of not having to think about it. And so that's the neuroscience behind it. And a lot of people don't understand that. Now we have a very small window to building those neural pathways for small children. And the football world literally has not caught up to what science already knows. And that is, is that skill acquisition happens much earlier than supposed. Mm -hmm. But you still, you know, you go to all the coaching courses, which I've done, and I'm an instructor on courses as well. And we still have not adjusted to what that, that golden age of skill acquisition is. And people are still confused about it. So that's why there's a lot of questions about it. That's my little two cents about it. Okay. Hey, I got to show you this book. I've had this book for 20, yeah. 20 plus years. And it's still Sorry. like my favorite book. I, I have it right in my office. And this is what I, I used way back in 1999 when I started a little club called Catalyst. And it was all based on, you know, I was a young coach. I was like 26 years old. And we started you know, this type of stuff and really loved this stuff right here. And you can see all the photos in here, guys, that Renee is talking about how it breaks down in dominating the 1v1 situation. And then, you know, it goes into combination play. But you'll see in the book, he's got plenty of games in here. Yeah. Plenty of different fun exercises that are games. So it wasn't all isolated training like everyone's talking about. It's, it's always a combination of both, right? Um, so I have um, one other big, big question, Renee, uh, and it's coming from Sanjeev, but it's also coming, I'm sure, from a lot of people. And I know it's, 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 uh, it, it would be uh, real fun to dive into, into your work with Cristiano Ronaldo. Yeah. And, and maybe, you know, what, what did that look like? What, what were some of the details of that? And, and how many times a week? How did you talk to him? And I know that would be something I think a lot of people would be interested in. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was the, uh, I think the 2008, 2009 season. And uh, at that time, I was obviously working as the tactical coach with the, with the first team. I wasn't uh, as such traveling uh, with the team to, to the games, uh, especially away games. So I basically stayed behind. Uh, and the players that weren't selected or coming back from injury or whatever, um, I had a lot of contact time with them, which, which was great. And at, at that particular season, Cristiano was, I think, suspended for the first, I think, three or four games, three games at least, which meant we played from week to week. So basically, you know, when, when United were playing, you know, let's say on a, on, a, on a Saturday, you know, they would travel on a Friday so I could work with him on a Friday. I worked on him on game day Saturday and I worked him on Sunday. So at three days, sometimes just me and him, sometimes other players that were, uh, in, in and around and evolved and all that. But it gave me a good opportunity to obviously to get to know him, what his thinking was, what he wanted, um, etc. And, and one of the things that I I felt was that he needed to become a more prolific goal scorer. That was, that was one of the things. Um, and I think I've got maybe some other things as part of the book, really, um, that I can share with you here. So the, the, the specific technical training I did with Christian, but also the finishing. But what it says there, the aim was to bring Ronaldo from awareness to understanding in relation to scoring more goals. So if I just go a bit further down to that segment of the book, and you can see a little bit of an idea how that book looks like, but I want to get to the finishing bit. And we also had, obviously, renewed Ruud van Nistelrooy at the time I worked with. But you come back and you see the same four colors again. Yeah, yellow physical, mental, and technical. And if you look at it physically, these are the things I needed to address. So what I did with Cristiano at one point, first of all, I wanted to make him understand how important it is that if you've got, if you've got aims and targets from research, you, those people that have aims and targets, and especially the ones that have written them down, are far more successful in trying to achieve that. So I said to Cristiano, I says, have you already set your goals for the season? He says, what do you mean? 
He says, how many goals have you scored? He says, 23. He says, great. So, but I, I imagine you want to do better this year, wouldn't you? So, you know, and what do you think? Or are you happy with 23? No, I want to be better. Okay, so what do you think? He says, 30. He says, okay, that's seven more. That's good. He says, what do you think? I says, I think 40. He says, yeah, but it's nearly double. He says, yeah, but we haven't really worked on anything yet. You scored 23 goals because of what you, knew now, what you know now and what you do now. I think there's plenty of things that we can work on and we can add. And I want to emphasize this word add because when I worked with players and especially first team and, and, and top, top players, I never used the word change. I always use the word add. When you use the word change, the first reaction of players will be, well, what I'm doing wrong. Yeah, so well, who are you telling me to, to, you know, but if you use the word add, add is more. And the first reaction will be, well, let, show me, what is it? You know, can you tell me what it is? And when you show it's right, they will embrace it. So with Cristiano, that, that jigsaw puzzle that you guys saw before, I've set those players down and I did it on a piece of paper. I wrote it down. I asked them what their strengths and, and things were that they needed to improve. And bit by bit, they could see. Because if you want players to work on themselves, you need to make them aware again and understand where the strengths are and where the areas are to improve. If players don't know themselves, they can't relate to it. How can they get better? Because they don't know themselves. So the first thing I needed to do is making Cristiano Ronaldo aware and understand of how that jigsaw puzzle related to him. The next thing was how that related to finishing. So we looked at the physical aspect. What do we need to be good at? We need to have good balance. We need to have good connection. We need to have good follow through, you know, physically good follow through. Mentally, we need to be confident. We need to be calm. We need to be clinical. Because Ronaldo, uh, in the video clips that I showed him, he missed a lot of good opportunities just because he wanted to always create and score the perfect goal. Technically, it's all about how to finish, different parts of the foot, the technical execution, whether you tap it in, you chip it, or you lace it. Tactically, where are you? And what type of finish are you using? So those were the things I explained to him. What I then did was, I set him down on, on you know off the pitch, I brought him in, and I made an about 10 minute, maybe eight minute video of goal scored by Dwight York, uh, Andy Cole, Solskjaer, sharing him of an asteroid. And in those eight minutes, he just saw bang, 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 one goal after the other. And I said to him, just look at these goals and tell me what you see. He looked at the clips, eight minutes, and he said, what did you see? He says, I saw a lot of goals. I said, great, I saw that too. But that's not what I meant. What did you see? He says, what do you mean? He says, well, I'm going to ask you the question again. We're going to look at the clips again. I want you to analyze, what do you see? We looked at the clips again, and then he said, yeah, I know what you mean. Most of the goals are scored within the box. Most of the goals are scored with one or two touch, and there is a massive variety in goal score. Tappings, volleys, headers, whatever. He says, all those three things are the three things we're gonna work on on the pitch. So we're gonna work on the attitude. Yeah, which is, as you can see, blue is mental. That's what top strikers have, the ultimate belief in scoring. They shoot to score. A lot of finishing practices that you see, yeah, is actually going a wall. It's rubbish, you know what I mean? Because kids are just hitting the ball, but they're not shooting to score. Yeah, shooting to score, expect the right type of shot, accuracy, etc., and so on. So the next thing I was going to work on with him was positioning in relation to the goal. Distance and angle. Inside the box, outside the box, or long range. Straight in front of goal or at an angle. That's yellow. So it's all tactical. Then I was working on the shooting zones. I explained you that in the middle. Yeah? You got two, three zones. Zone one, central and straight in front of goal. Zone left two or right two. That's a little bit at an angle. And zone left three and right three. That's close to the byline. Then we needed to look at the attempt. Direct. <clears throat> so a one touch finish or is it a finish after a first touch all those things are look they're tactical they're physical they're mental and they're technical everything comes together in an attempt the type of shot is it a driven shot or placed is it bent 
Or is it a curve? Is it chip or a lope? Or is the volume half fully? Yeah, and then last one, what target area are we going for? So if you look at the goal, what zone were you in? What angle? Are we going to score low, middle, or high? Are we going to score in the middle of the goal? Completely straight or to the left or to the right? Top corner, left, right, bottom corner, left, right. These were the things we're going to cover. If I analyze any striker and they score goals, then you can look at all those six points. If anything goes wrong, something goes wrong down low, uh, along those lines. It might be the one, number one. It might be a lack of confidence. You might look at Timo Werner from Chelsea. At the moment, he can't score a goal. His confidence is shot. The next thing what you then need to do is, is analyze all those things and try to find out where it is actually going wrong because then you can address it. So that is what I did with, uh, with Cristiano Ronaldo. So look, and these are the three different zones. Zone straight in front of the goal. Yeah, and remember, the goal never moves. The goalkeeper does. This is the zone left two, left right. Most of the goals, this is the best area to score. Most of the goals are scored coming from these angles because the opposition is not stupid and they try to block those areas. If you come in zone three, most likely you go into the byline. It's not impossible to score, but you're most likely looking for a cross or a cutback. If you are in zone three, you would want to be the player going to zone two because it will increase your chances to score a goal. If you get in a 1v1 in zone 2 here, you would want to get to zone 1 because it will increase your chances to score. So all those things are worked on. These are the target areas. So nine target areas. Goalkeeper will be whatever position you are, and then you choose what areas you're going to go. Now, to help them to do that, there it is. Middle of the goal, best chances to score. You come at an angle. You know, there's a defender there low and hard on the bottom corner, or you have to drive it maybe in the far corner. Um, same thing here. Can you beat them on the outside, cut back, or can you go inside and then bend it in? All different techniques. So basically, and this is one of the examples what I did with Cristiano, a lot of times with mannequins, but I put four bibs in the goal, green, yellow, red, and blue, like the jigsaw puzzle. And I would work with him, very simple, always in repetitions of four. The reasons why, four, the focus and concentration stays high, yeah, and the physical execution stays high. If you go five, six, seven, eight, up goes down. Coaching at top level, at every level really, but it, it, it makes more difference at top level. It's all about intensity and quality. Those are interlinked. So I would put Cristiano at this mannequin here. I would be here, and I would say, you know, he comes off. I would play him the ball. And then he needs to set himself, and then he would try to score on the green bit. Sometimes I would call that. Sometimes he would have to tell me which bit he would go for. And you see all those different positions I would play the ball into. Four from this side, then four from here, then four from here, four from here. And then we would move on. So you get all different angles, different approaches in and around the box. And this is all basically finishing in isolation. There's nothing else than a mannequin because most of the time I was, was me and him, maybe one other player. If we did have a goalkeeper, great. If we didn't, I put something something else in goal, but it was all about him hitting those areas. And the most important thing for me, for him, from awareness to understanding was I wanted him to understand the importance that he was know what zone he's in, what options he would have to finish, and what sort of type of finish he would have. The more he would score, and I have said to him, he says, whilst you get older in your career, all the goals you're going to score in the games, you've already scored on a training pitch. You already have done it. It's in your hard drive. The only thing what you then to do is access very, very quickly your movement, your position, your movement, and obviously what, uh, what, a, what an attempt is going to be, direct, or do you need a touch, uh, what sort of type, et cetera, et cetera. So all these drills that are all in this book here, all different ones are all about that finishing. Okay. And then obviously we brought them into, uh, what do you call it? Um, into games and game situations as well when teams were together. So that was basically the process. So Cristiano, just to finish the story, he said 23 goals, 30 goals. He said, 
by the 28th of January that season, he had scored 30 goals. So I said to him, I says, listen, congratulations. You've, uh, you've achieved your target, 30 goals. So what are you going to do now for March, April and May? We're still, we're still in the league. We can win the league. We can still win the Champions League. What are you going to do? I says, I said 40. I think you need to try to get to 40. He says, yes, I'm going to try to reach your target. And that season, Cristiano Ronaldo, I think he went top scorer. Um, in that season, I, I'm not entirely sure, but I thought he scored 43 or 46 goals. So he doubled his tally just by two things, bringing him from awareness to understanding and practice, repetition and success. And that is basically the, the Ronaldo story, um, you know, from my time that I've worked with him. And like I said, it's nicely, it's nicely uh, put in the book. Great. Absolutely uh, amazing time um, spent with you today. I know I, I don't have your book, but I'm going to be ordering it today. <laughs> I know that. Um, now, the, the, good thing, the good thing about the book, uh, uh, Paul, as well as if I may say, is that it's not just, it's just not just a book about, uh, you know, just session after session after session. What I, what I really try to explain is, and I think that is for every success, what, are, what, what were the parameters at United at the time for us being so successful? And those parameters really is for any team. It's for any team. You know, like I said, it, it explains exactly, you know, the qualities that I, that I analyzed in top teams. But even if I'm working, it doesn't matter. Even if I'm working with the Houston uh, under-18 team, those things still apply. That jigsaw puzzle, you can apply on every player. It doesn't change. It doesn't matter whether you are Ronaldo or you are somebody else. You know what I mean? That's the good thing, I think, about it. It explains a lot about my ideas uh, behind it and, and how, you know, you can implement it to yourself in your club situation or even for your own team. It will, it will definitely be, um, you know, beneficial in terms of understanding what are the qualities of a successful team. And there's a note here that, just a note, everybody, because there are a couple of options how you can buy books, but Soccer Tutor is the best way to buy the book. That's what I'm being told right here. So you got it right there. I'll tell you what. Um, I mean, I'm very fortunate because I get to travel around the world. I'm invited by FIFA, UEFA. I speak at conference after conference after conference. But I hear all of the other talks, all of the other experts from all the federations and big clubs around the world. Rene, this presentation you did was so perfect because every person that watched this benefited from it. More often than not, I sit in these presentations and the stuff that the coaches are talking about are so high level, so sophisticated. Everything that you talked about is applicable for every age group. So thank you a million. I mean, this is, and me, I've seen your presentation a couple of times where every time I've taken five new pages of notes, okay? So, I mean, thank you very much. This was a big, big treat for everybody. Uh, we had nearly a hundred people came on to this today. Um, so I just want to say thank you for doing this for everybody. No, great. And, and like I said, uh... Happy to happy to do it. I think, like I said, I'm, I'm really happy with 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 you know people that have the passion for the game. And more than anything, we we both feel the same. Tom, you, Paul, the importance of having the obligation to to do the right things for all those young upcoming soccer players. And the more the more coaches, you know, that 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 are are doing it in 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 the in 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 the way that we see because it, it is the right way. That that is for me the most important thing. I've I've I was lucky. There's a lot of experts like Tom says. They talk and talk and talk, and if you then really ask and say, yeah, but what have you done? Where, where's the proof? I've I've lived the proof. It's there. I've I've experienced it myself. I've done it with those kids. Those kids are now playing for the biggest team. You know, for Manchester United first team, they, they, they play for their country, they're winning things. That for me is the most satisfying things. I know it works. And I'll tell you, I would do exactly the same. I said this in a conversation between Tom and Paul. If Paul would hire me for the Houston Dynamo, I would do exactly the same because I know it works. Yeah. And, and, and like I said, and it's so rewarding. It's so rewarding to see those kids, you know, absorbing 
that that enthusiasm of learning new things and put them in the right playing environment, you know, where they really play with a smile on their face, you know, and they're not being directed constantly and they're not, uh, what do you call it, get put off because they have to win. Kids always compete. Don't worry about that. Let not winning stand in the way of their uh, of their enjoyment of the game and their development. That is my last message. Absolutely. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you, Renee. Um, man, I hope we can maybe get you on again because it just that was that was one of my favorite yeah. times right now. This last hour and a half with you, uh, we went over a little bit. We could have gone over it. You're right. It flew by. It absolutely flew by. Um, well, thank you to everybody that jumped on. Um, yeah, almost 100 people jumped on from all over the country, uh, all over our continent and, and in Europe, I see as well, which is great. Renee, you are, you are, uh, you are always a fan, but you're, you're now like, I mean, a friend and I appreciate you taking the time to share with us. So thank you so much. No problem. And uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to come over one day, Paul. That's a promise. I, I want to get you over here as soon as we can. Would love to. Um, <laughs> okay. Thank everybody, you, guys. Everybody, thank you for joining. Um, I really, really appreciate it. We did record this. Um, I don't know. I mean, if you do want the recording, we'll figure out some way to do it. Um, but you can always email me. I think you guys know my email address. It's, I'll put it in the chat. And, um, and, and one, one more thing. I mean, we talked about all of Renee's past success, but – Maybe people missed it. Uh, currently, Rene is the assistant coach to the Australian national team. Um, that's hopefully both going to go to the Olympics and also the World Cup. But uh, it's not like he's just sitting home writing books. He's still working. Yeah, yeah. I got still. Uh, I'm still not finished. <laughs> uh, like I said, I uh, qualifying for the Olympics was was a miracle in itself because of the. The struggles we had to 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 get the best players out of the clubs and, and and the players in Australia didn't have any playing time, so you really have to ma you know maximise the time with those guys and, and and get them to buy into what we won. But we pulled it off, a uh, fantastic achievement. So you know, looking forward to get to the Olympics. Uh, let's let's pray that they do take place and and that will be another great experience. And then the next thing is to qualify for the World Cup. And I I really hope that at that time, guys, when you tune in. And that is my, that's our ambition with Australia that everybody says, did you see Australia play? Yeah. I hope you will see tendencies that we've talked about today that players do something they think. I can remember Rennie talking about this webinar and look at this, look at this player. And we never expected, you know, that from players from, from Australia. But they will be there, promise me. Absolutely. Please. All right. Well, that's a good note to, to end on, I think, huh, Paul? Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, everybody. everybody. Thank you so much and good luck with everything. All right, see you. See you. Thank you, Rene. Bye, guys. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.